I want to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, with out self control. We are there, people. We are living in what Timothy is speaking about right now. There is no control in the kingdom of God. Just because somebody says it does not mean that it is truth. Just because you see it on the internet doesn't mean it's real. And what do we do? We latch on to that. And we speak it as though it is gospel. And when we speak that as though that is a thus saith, a thus saith the Lord. You are misrepresenting God. And God is going to say, why did you speak on my behalf when that wasn't even from me? You allowed the devil to take hold. You allowed the devil to grip your mind. And when he grips your mind, how does he grip it mostly? With fear. When you walk in fear, you will believe fanciful fables. Because instead of waiting upon the Lord, we become such a microwave society. We don't have the patience to wait upon the Lord. We want the answer now. We want it quick and we don't want to wait. And that's the number one reason why there's so much confusion in the body of Christ. Because this person has 1.5K followers or this person has 275K followers then they must know something more than I do about God. Because why would they have all of these followers? But did you know people can have an enormous amount of followers but still be ignorant of the truth? Just because they have followers, massive followers, doesn't mean that they have knowledge of the word of God. And when you put credibility in these people that have not studied to show themselves approved, then what are you doing? You are learning their dogma and their lies. And then God is going to have to pull you aside and eradicate that thinking out of you before he can ever use you as a vessel. Because now what you've done is you've corrupted yourself with lies and half-truths and doctrines that aren't even biblical. So I tread very lightly and I make sure that before I ever say anything out of my mouth, because the fruit of the spirit is self-control. I'm going to make sure that I can back it up in scripture. Because if I can't back it up in scripture, throw it away. It ain't worth nothing. You've got people right now that aren't backing up anything with scripture. 
and they're just opening up their mouths and going off on a wild tangent, like Don Quixote chasing windmills. And there's no credibility, no validity, no veracity in what they are saying. Because they cannot back up anything from the word. So tonight is a hot trigger topic. And it's about the end times. And the mark of the beast. We are going to demystify the mark of the beast tonight. And I'm going to use scripture to prove it to you. So let me know if you can see the screen that I'm about to share. And then we'll get into it. Can you guys see it? You're good. Okay. I'm going to enlarge this so it's full screen. All right. Maybe I'm not. Okay. Why is this an enlarging? It's it's not that one. Move over um, to the next. Oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Eric. You're welcome. The end times. Is it all enlarged? Can everybody see it? Is it big? All right. The end times. What you must know. In order to understand, we must go back to the basics. Where do we go back to the basics? From the Old Testament. Because everything from the Old Testament is a type and shadow of what the New Testament is. You can't build the foundation in the New Testament. The Old Testament is where you build the foundation. The New Testament is the rest of the revelatory knowledge and the revelation of what God was trying to teach from the Old Testament. Okay? How many types and shadows do we see of the seven-year tribulation throughout the Bible? There's so many types and shadows. I don't have time to reveal them all, but I picked some ones that I thought were really pertinent. There's types and shadows all throughout the word. Sevens. What does seven what does it represent? What does it mean? Seven is used frequently in the Bible, right? Seven is simply this. It's God's completeness. Now, somebody who would like to read, I want somebody to read Genesis 1, 31. And then somebody else get the next passage, Genesis 2, 1 through 3. This is going to be an interactive type of thing. We're going to really get into scripture. Okay, Catherine, go ahead. You're on, you're on, you need to unmute yourself. You wanted Genesis 31, you said? 131. 131. Okay. Yeah. Then God saw everything that he had made. And indeed, it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And God rested on what day? The seventh. The seventh day, which represents completeness from the grand design that he created at the beginning. He built and created six days and saw that everything was good. And then he rested on the seventh day. Okay, who wants to read Genesis 2, 1 through 3? I will. Okay, go ahead. So Genesis 2, chapter 2, 1 through 3. Uh -huh. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all of their vast array. 
By the seventh day, God had finished the work that he had been doing. And so on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from the work of creating that he had done. Amen. So look at the, look at the chart. He blessed the seventh day and declared it sacred. Sacred is another, another name for ceremony. He made it a ceremonial process. He wanted people to understand that the seventh day is holy. Daniel 2.21 says, and he changes the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom to the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. Seven can also refer to com a complete cycle or something that is established. So God was establishing the seventh day as a sacred ceremony of what? Of worship. Remember that word worship, because worship is going to come back into play later. God has the final say in everything. He is our hand of providence, and he is our sovereign Lord. And there's nothing that happens on this earth or all the galaxies and universes combined that the Lord does not know about. If the very hairs of your head are numbered and he knew you before you were in your mother's womb, I think he can run the universe. Amen? Now, as we can see, God holds the number seven in high regard. The Bible is full of things grouped in seven. One, we have creation. Then we have a Sabbath day. Then we have famines. Remember, Joseph, he had the dream, the seven years of plenty and the seven years of lack. War, Joshua went around the battle of Jericho seven times, right? Jesus said, forgive them 70 times seven. There'll be the 70 weeks of Daniel according to tribu in, in, in tribulation, and miracles, washing the Jordan seven times. Remember when, when, um, when uh, the evil servant uh, with, with, uh, with Elijah, he told him to go wash the, the, the um, what was his name? G G G um, starts with a G, forgot what his name was. Gehazu or, but the servant, Elijah, told him to go wash seven times and the leprosy would be removed. How many times did Elijah speak before the hand, the cloud that looked like a hand came forth? Seven times. So somebody read Joshua 6, 2 through 4. And then while we're getting that one, Another person read 1 Kings 18, 42 through 44, and then Psalms 119, 164. I got it. Okay, go ahead. And the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have given Jericho, its king and mighty men of valor into your hands. You shall march around the enclosure, all the men of war going around the city once. This you shall do for six days, and seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns, and on the seventh day you shall march around the enclosure seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. So how many sevens do we see in that example? We see three, right? Uh, yes, I think. 
Trinity. It represents the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Yeah. And every one of them, it was complete. And did the walls come down on the seventh day? Yes, they did. Because God was starting a completion for Israel. Those enemies had to be removed from the equation in order for the completion to happen. So God could rebirth and build Israel again. So every time you see the number seven in the Bible, it's a sign of completion. Okay, next verse, 1 Kings 18, 42 and 40 through 44, please. I can read it. Okay. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. Mm -hmm. Then he bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. So he went up. So when he went up and looked, he said, there is nothing. And seven times he said, go again. Then it came to pass the seventh time that he said, there is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. So he said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Amen. So how many times did the servant go up? Seven times. So you might be going through a trial or tribulation on the first time. Keep going. Get to that seventh time. Because God honors that number. Don't give up. Say, look, Lord. Seven is a sacred number to you. It's a number of completion. And what you did for Joshua, what you did for Elijah and all these other people, because you were a God that changes not, I ask the same thing right now. God has to uphold his word. He has to honor his scripture. There's nothing that God will not do for you that they that he didn't do for them you just have to believe it you just have to believe it that you know that you know that when you reach that number seven god is going to move on your behalf okay someone read psalms 119 164 i read it okay Seven times a day, I praise you because of your righteous judgments. So seven times a day, he was praising God for his righteous judgments. And that was David, right? So when David was praying for righteous judgments, did God act on David's wishes? He delivered David not only from Saul... But he delivered David from Absalom. He delivered David from wars. Because David believed what the Lord had said. And because David understood the covenant of the Old Testament, he also understood how sacred the seventh day was to God. So David reminded him, seven times and then God delivered him he'll do the same for you if God excuse me for that if God holds the seventh day sacred why on earth would he change it That's a question I want you to mull around in your head because I'm going to prove something to you later about this very question. 
Did God change the Sabbath? Or did man? Who observed? I got to move this thing. This is like getting out of control here. <laughs> Who observed the Sabbath? Everyone in the Old Testament that believed in Jehovah. Everyone in the New Testament who believed in Jehovah. And Jesus and the disciples observed the Sabbath day as holy. There is no change documented in the word of God. Did you know that? There's not a single change in the Bible. So who changed it? Was this man God? Did he have the authority to change God's Sabbath? This is Constantine we're talking about from the Roman Empire. He says, on the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in cities rest and let all workshops be closed. What gives him the right and the authority to do that? Venerable means a ceremony, an ancient practice. So he's taking the authority away from God. He's taking the authority away and becoming as God. And he doesn't have the right to do this. Okay? You with me so far? We don't know what we don't know. Did God authorize this change? Listen to what the Catholic Church, the Catholic Record of London, Ontario, September 1st, 1923 said. Sunday is our, the Vatican's mark of authority. The church is above the Bible. And the transference of Sabbath from Saturday observance is proof of that fact. Look what else they say. The Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine, page 50. We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea, AD 363, transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. The Catholic Church transferred this. Do you see that? Did you catch what was said? Sunday is the Vatican's mark of authority. Where does the word mark come from? It comes from karagma in the Greek, meaning God's mark is etched into you. It's an engraving. It's an etching into your forehead. If you read Revelations 14.1, it says the Father's name was written in their foreheads, which is the laws of God. And the name Anoma, which is from the Greek, it means authority. So if you look at what that means, it says the Father's name, his authority the Father's authority, the Father's anoma, the Father's authority was written in their foreheads, which is the laws of God. So anybody that is following the laws of God, they are marked by God because you're upholding his laws. What's the Bible saying? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul and love thy neighbor as thyself. If you're doing those things, you have the karagma of God right here in the frontal lobe of your forehead. And you prove it by your actions with your hand. Carax is the root word of karagma, and it means a bound, a boundary. It's either you're going to have a boundary of Satan, or you're going to have a boundary of God. The first type and shadow of the mark of the beast that we see is in the Garden of Eden. 
the boundary. Kerox is either the boundary of God or Satan. When Eve took the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that was a type and a shadow of the mark of the beast. She stepped outside the Kerox, which is the boundary of God, and entered the boundary of Satan, the Kerox of Satan. She was not keeping the law of God. She wanted the other knowledge written on her head. And how did she receive the knowledge? She used her hand and her works to get it. So when we talk about the mark of the beast, we have to understand what the forehead and the right hand represent. The forehead means the knowledge of whatever, and the right hand represents the working of using that knowledge. Are we learning? Praise God. Where is the first mentions of the mark or sign of God? Somebody read Deuteronomy 6, 8, and then somebody read Deuteronomy eleven eighteen. Yep, go ahead. You had to uh, unmute your mic, Catherine. <laughs> You're still muted. There you okay. go. There okay. You. you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And he's talking about the laws of God. And what did we mention the laws of God were in the last, in the last slide? What is the law of God? Well, a boundary. If I'm not no. mistaken. Oh. No, it's, not the, it's, not, it's not the boundary. It's his authority. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind. His anoma is his authority, and his authority is his law. Okay? Okay, so somebody read Deuteronomy eleven eighteen. I will. Okay. So it says, fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. And tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them to your forehead. And bind them to your forehead. So he's talking once again about the laws of God. So what we're doing is we're de demystifying all of this junk that we've been taught for years and years and years. We're going to shed light on what it truly is. The Sabbath equals a sign or a mark. Tell the people of Israel, be careful to keep my Sabbath day, for the Sabbath is a sign mark of the covenant between me and you from generation to generation. It is given so that you may know that I am, and this means Yahuwah, which is the God, God is my salvation. Yahuwah means God is my salvation. It is given so that you may know that, that I am God of your salvation, who makes your Kodesh, which is holy. That's where we get the word, uh, you know, Kodesh from the Holy Spirit. The Ruhak Kodesh is the Holy Spirit. And that's Exodus 31.13. Keep going. Ezekiel 20, 12 says, also, I instituted my Sabbath for them as a sign or mark between me and them. So they, they would know that I am once again, the same word, Yahuwah, God is my salvation, who has set them apart. Then he says in Ezekiel 20, 20, keep my Sabbath Kodesh, holy that they may be a sign between us that you will know that I am, once again, the same word, God is my salvation. You're Elihim, God, Ezekiel 20, 20. 
whose Sabbath do you honor? The seventh day Sabbath of God is your salvation or the first day, which is Sunday, the Sabbath of the Lord Baal. Whose sign or mark do you honor? This is the mark of who you will serve. Elihim, which is God, whose name is written upon you. So it's quite clear what the mark is. The mark of the Lord Baal, which was Moloch worship, okay? Baal was supposedly in charge of the weather and the sun. That's where we get Sunday worship, the sun, okay? But before the Babylonian system, the Egyptians had their own system of a deity, and his name was Ra, and he was the god of the sun. He was the sun god. So what Constantine did is he combined the Mithra worship, which was Mithra worship was the old Babylonian sun god worship. That's what the Ro that's what Romanish was before the Roman Catholic Church was merged into it. So the Romanish religion was a form of Mithra worship, okay? And then what he did is when he decided to make the venerable day of the Lord Sunday, he married Christianity with the Mistra, Mithra worship and the Romanish, thus birthing Roman Catholicism. That's why you see all the statues and the deities in the Catholic Church, because they're following the old Romanish religion of worshiping idols. When we pray, when we pray to Mary, or we bow down to statues in a Catholic church, we are committing idolatry. The Lord says, thou shall have no other gods before me. He says not to make any graven images. So why is the Catholic church doing this? Because they are following a tainted doctrine that the devil established to destroy the veracity of the word. The devil has been using the sun to signify who he is for a very long time. Is he not called the angel of light in the Bible? Why would God call him the angel of light? Freemasons call him the light bearer. They call him Lucifer, the light bearer. And when you get up into the 33rd degree, you know exactly who you are serving. That's in the Morals and Dogma by Albert Pike. So the devil has not done anything new under the sun. All he's doing is counterfeiting the truth. We know who the light of the world is. It's Jesus Christ. So do you think the devil's going to sit back and try to usurp? You think the devil's going to sit back and let Jesus do what he wants? No, he's going to try to usurp that authority with a counterfeit measure. So let's continue. The forehead represents the laws of God you keep in your mind. The hand represents the actions you commit knowing and keeping God's laws. The mark of the beast will be enforced Sunday observance, which is willful rejection for God's seventh day Sabbath and his law. Now, remember how I told you we have to make sure that we remember how I told you the word worship was going to come back up later. Right. Because worship, what is worship? What is worship It is the sacred ceremony of the seventh day Sabbath that God made. This is why he says in Revelations 13, 12, causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship 
The worship is the key word here. The worship will fall on the Sunday. The image of the beast should, should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship. There it is again. Again, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, Revelations 14, 9. Are you starting to see? Is it starting to become demystified? You starting to get it? Praise God. Ron Wyatt. Many people don't know who he was, but I'm going to explain it, um, who he was. He was an anesthesiologist from Memphis, Tennessee. But what he did, God used him as an amateur archaeologist to uncover some of the most astounding finds in the biblical archaeological record that have ever been found. And many people want to discredit him, but there's so many people that absolutely worked with him that knew him personally, that said that the discoveries that he talked about were absolutely truth and that he found them. So this is an interview with Ronald Wyatt talking about when he uncovered the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant has been found and it's been hidden away ever since 1982. But Ronald Wyatt found it. And the, the interesting thing about this conversation, this is what he says. He was in Jeremiah's grotto and he had a video camera and he had a camera and he was taking pictures and videos. And the angels of the Lord would not let him remove the material from the cave. So this is what he's talking about. Ron Wilde, two things were stated. One, that if I was faithful, I would have the privilege of sharing this. And he was faithful, sharing that he found the Ark of the Covenant. But here's the interesting thing. And the second was that when the mark of the beast law was in force, that shortly after that was when this would take place. So the Ark of the Covenant will not be revealed until the mark of the beast law goes in force until it's enforced and then he says and there was a little bit of a conundrum it was stated as the mark of the beast law it wasn't it wasn't stated as the mark of the beast law it was stated when the sunday law but i tell people and think that it's wiser to tell people that since it's not lying or deceiving it is that when the mark of the beast law is enforced. So the mark of the beast law and the Sunday law is the same thing. And he said, but the angel told me it was a Sunday law. But it's the same thing. The Sunday law and the mark of the beast law is the same thing. And you're going to have to decide who you're going to serve. For me and my house, I will serve the Lord. It's either you're going to worship God on the seventh day Sabbath, or you're going to worship the beast on the sixth day, the first day of the week. I'm sorry, the, thir the first day of the week. So anybody that's telling you all this other stuff right now, obviously, They've not read the word of God. They've not gone back to the Greek. They've not been good Bereans. All they're doing is what I told you they were doing in 2 Timothy. They're not holding on to sound doctrine. They're being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. But see, I'm backing everything up with scripture. Everything that I'm telling you can be backed up in scripture. It gets better. Ron Wyatt, I, I recommend you highly to go to www.ronwyatt.com. He has discovered Mount Sinai. He was in Mount Sinai. Look at this picture at the top of this mountain. That mountain is burnt. That's where the presence of God was on the, 
on the mountain. And when you get close to the mountain, the only area that is charred in black is at the top of that mountain. The Saudi Arabian government knew that this was a holy site and they blocked it off. They put, they put barbed wire all around it so nobody could go up to see it. Why are they going to do that if that's just a set of rocks? Because Ron Wyatt found an altar there. He found hieroglyphics there that came from Egypt. He found, he found calves, drawings of calves on the hieroglyphics. He found 12 white stones, which represents the 12 tribes of Israel. He found a holding area that contained a place where a million people or millions of people could live. This rock right here, that has a split right down the middle of it, there's erosion at the bottom of this rock. And it's only from water. They did an analysis and they took a sample and they said the erosion came from water coming out of this rock. You remember when, you remember when Moses struck it and it split in two? There's a big, huge fissure right in the middle of that rock. And if you explore it more, you will see the bottom of it. It has complete erosion from water being there. He found that. He also found chariot wheels. See that chariot wheel right there in the bottom of that water? Those chariot wheels were under the Gulf of Aqaba where the Red Sea crossing was. Because he saw on one side he saw a marble pillar that was erected on one side, on the Jewish side, on, on the, you know, on the, the Egyptian side. And he said back in, when he discovered it on the Saudi Arabian side, there were still writing on the other side. So there was two pillars, one erected on one side and another pillar erected on the other side. And he said, before I had a chance to take pictures of it, the, the Saudi Arabian government knocked it down. But it had etchings of Moses. It talked about Moses. It talked about the Israelites. It talked about the Red Sea. And they knocked it all down and broke it. So it's not there anymore. This picture right here is a sulfur ball. And they analyzed this sulfur inside this ball, and it's the most pure sulfur in the world. It's 99.9% .9 pure. And it's the only place in the world that has this pure sulfur. And it's a sulfur ball because he found Sodom and Gomorrah. These are all ashen remains of a city that burned in fervent heat really fast. He's got videos of all this stuff. He goes and he touches, he touches the, this, the, these ashen remains and they just crumble. And you can find all of these sulfur balls embedded into this, into this. Oops, sorry. What happened? Go back. You can see all these uh, sulfur balls that are embedded in, in all of this. So he found all this stuff. He found... He found Noah's Ark, and then many scientists poo-pooed his, his discovery, but the Turkish government, come on, stop doing this. The, Tur the Turkish government built a Noah, a Noah um, come on, go back. See that little building, see that little hut right there next to that boat? That is, the Turkish government built this, and it's the Noah's Ark Welcoming Center. But you don't see, you don't hear of these things. You're not going to hear of these things because the devil's trying to keep them hush hush. He doesn't want these things coming out. And he will try to discredit everybody that speaks about these things because it proves that God is alive, it proves that the word of God is truth. So Ronald Wyatt 
also found the Ark of the Covenant. He found the table of showbread. He found the golden candlesticks. He found the menorah. He found everything. And the Israeli government knows all about it. Stephanie Concert, who comes on our chat every once in a while, she's from the Levitical order of priests. And when, when she went to Israel, she had the opportunity to go see the Ark of the Covenant. But she did not go because she said there was such a, a presence around that. She didn't want to get near it. She said it was inside a wall, but she could feel the presence of God around it. And many people that went in there died. She told me that after I, I told her about Ronald Wyatt. She already knew about Ronald Wyatt. She already knew about all of this. So the Ark of the Covenant will only come out at the very end when the Mark of the Beast law is enforced. Not until. That's why you need to go to www.ronwyatt.com and read about what he, what he did. He passed, he passed away, but his legacy remains. Okay, so. The Sunday blue laws are already on the books in America since 1610. The Sunday blue law is a law that will be enforced at the end where you will have to make a decision if you want to serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob on the Sabbath day, or you're going to follow the beast system and the Antichrist system. It's already on the books since 1610. See, the Lord really wanted me to bring this because we have to understand what time we're living in. And I'm so thankful that the Lord wanted me to share this tonight. Are we learning? Are you liking what you're learning? Awesome. And he would think to change times and laws. The Antichrist would think to change times and laws. Daniel 7.25. Look what this says. The Catholic Cardinal Gibbons in Faith of Our Fathers, page 111, said, You may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday, a day which we never sanctify. Another one, the Catholic Church declared Cardinal Gibbons, by virtue of her divine mission, changed the day from Saturday to Sunday. What does God say in Exodus 20, 8 and 11? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within the gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that are in them, and is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it, he made it holy. What day are you worshiping? The sun was the main god of the heathen, even back as far as ancient Babylon. Since they worshiped the sun on Sunday, the compromising church leaders could see that if they changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, it would accomplish several things. Number one, it would separate them from the Jews who were hated by many of the Romans and who, along with Jesus, Luke 4, 16, had been worshiping on Saturday from the beginning and still do today. Number two, it would make it much easier for the pagans to come into the church if the Christians met on the same day the pagan world did. It worked well. Pagans flocked in by the thousands. Satan's plan of compromise was doing its baleful work. 
The change was attempted gradually, but many of the true-hearted, loyal Christians were alarmed. They came to the leaders and wanted to know why they had dared tamper with the law of the Almighty God. The church leaders knew this would happen, and they had an answer ready. It's a masterpiece. If a person doesn't know the Bible well, it sounds really good. The people were told that they were worshiping on Sunday now because Jesus rose from the dead on that day. That's not even one, that's, there's not even one verse in the Bible that tells you to do that. But that's what they were told. I was told that. You were told that. Maybe you've heard it recently. But that's not scriptural and that's not what God ever said to do. Matter of fact, God speaks of the seventh day 126 times in the Old Testament. And 62 times in the new, the first day of the week is mentioned only eight times in the New Testament. And it's not mentioned at all in the Old Testament. Here's a Methodist. The reason we observe the first day instead of the seventh is based on a no positive command. What? What do you mean a no positive command? It's all in the word. One will search the scriptures in vain for authority for changing from the seventh day to the first. Not going to find it. Baptist Harold Linsell said from editor of the Christianity Today, there is nothing in the scriptures that requires us to keep Sunday rather than Saturday as a holy day. The Episcopalian Church, the Bible commandment says on the seventh day thou shalt rest. That is Saturday. Nowhere in the Bible is it laid down that worship, worship should be done on Sunday. Satan has palmed off the biggest counterfeit in the history of man. Look at this shocker. The Catholic authorities proclaim that the Bible says, remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. The Catholic Church says, no, by my divine power, I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the command of the holy Catholic Church. So when we worship God on Sunday, we are partaking of the worship that Constantine established in 323 AD. Now that you know this, you will be held responsible for this. Now that you know this, you have no excuse not to worship God except on Saturday. The mark of the beast and the seal of God are direct opposites. In the end, everyone will have one or the other. Those who choose the seal of God will be with Jesus in his wonderful kingdom. That gorgeous paradise of beauty beyond our wildest dreams. It's a land where love, kindness, peace, and happiness reign. Those who choose the mark of the beast will be cast into the lake of fire. Now listen to what Revelation 7 says. 2 and 3 says, and I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. He had the seal. He had the, the knowledge. He had the authority, the anoma of God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. This passage of scripture shows you that these are believers that are being sealed in their foreheads because they kept the word of the Lord in their mind and their actions proved with their hands what they believed. First of all, what is God's seal? A seal is something having to do with a legal affair. A law is stamped with the seal of the ruling government. Remember what I said, karagma is an etching. It's an etching in. That mark is an etching in. It's not a vaccine. It's an etching in. It's a stamp. It's a mark. It's a literal mark where people are going to be able to dif dif differentiate between you and them. 
it's going to be it's going to have the name of the ruler the ruler's title and the territory of over which he rules the image the mark and his name that's what the image and the mark of his name is it's those three proponents the name of the ruler the ruler's title and the territory in which he rules the seal of God, where are we sealed? We are sealed in the forehead. His laws, they're in our hearts under the new covenant. His promise is, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds. Will I write them? Write them. He's etching in. He's etching it in. He's putting a stamp on you. The Holy Spirit places. I'm going to move this out of the way. Sorry. The Holy Spirit places the seal of God in your foreheads when we choose it. The forehead contains the frontal lobe. The section of the brain is where your conscience is. When you receive the seal of God in your forehead, it means you have it in your conscience. Your conscience. You believe it and you're loyal to it. The seal of God. The Sabbath is the seal of God. I'll repeat that. The Sabbath is the seal of of God. This is the only place in the Bible where you will find God's seal. Here are the three parts of the seal. His name is the Lord. His title is thy God creator, and his territory is heaven, earth, the sea, and all that in them is. He just told you what the seal of God is. That is fantastic. No wonder Satan has worked so hard to hide the truth of the sacred Sabbath from us. It's God's sign. You may ask, is the Sabbath really the seal of God? Look at Ezekiel 20, 12. Moreover, also I give them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. And hallow my Sabbath, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that ye may know that I am the Lord your God, Ezekiel 20, 20. The word sign means the same thing as seal in the Greek. Somebody read Romans 4, 11. Yep, go ahead. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. Okay. So that's a type and shadow right there. Do you understand? Do you see the type and shadow? The circumcised people are the ones that are going to follow the Sabbath. The uncircumcised are the ones that are going to follow the Sunday law. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. The righteous are the circumcised. Circumcision doesn't just mean the act that they did. Uh, to the foreskin circumcision also means you are circumcising yourself to the truth you're circumcising yourself to the law of god written in your heart and in your head that's why he said they are considered righteous but the uncircumcision or the people who are going to take the mark of the beast will not be righteous. Do you see that there? He's talking about them. 
He's not only talking about the physical circumcisions, he's talking about the spiritual circumcisions. He's giving you a type and shadow of the mark of the beast system right there. And who is circumcised follows the Sabbath. The ones that aren't circumcised do not follow the Sabbath. So he's establishing and showing you right there. They have the seal of God on them. They are considered righteous because they are circumcised, keeping the laws and the truth of the word of God, but they're also keeping the Sabbath holy the way the Lord told you to do it. Hallelujah. Ah, oh, come on. I'm not good at this yet. I'm still, I'm still learning. <laughs> All right. So look at this. Revelations 13, 16 through 18. And he, who's he? The Antichrist causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. He is the Antichrist. He has to be on the scene before a mark is introduced. So anybody telling you anything else that the mark of the beast is here is a liar and a heretic, and they're not telling you the truth. It's not the word of God. Don't listen to them because they are, they are teaching you another gospel and another Jesus. Look what the word says right there. And he, the Antichrist, that's the modifier. He is the modifier of Antichrist. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. But he has not been revealed to the world yet. We don't know who he is. So there's no mark of the beast yet. Somebody read 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4. It will not happen until 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4 occur. So somebody read 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 4. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes seat, his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. So that day cannot happen until he is revealed do you see that eric who's the antichrist who's the antichrist right now anyone that opposes christ and i and i say that i say that generically because <laughs> you know what i'm getting at yeah i know what you're getting at um uh, but that, that man has not been revealed. Exactly. So if that man has not been revealed, the mark of the beast isn't here yet, people. So all these people saying, oh, I heard a word from the Lord. Told me the vaccine is the mark of the beast. If you take it, you're going to hell. What? God's going to contradict his word? Because the last time I checked, God can't contradict his word. He said he upholds everything by the word of his power. The minute God contradicts his word, it makes him a liar. And then the world will no longer be. So these things cannot happen until the third temple must be rebuilt because he said that he sitteth in the temple of God. So there has to be a third temple built. And I've heard the argument, oh, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Christians are. But what about the Hasidic Jews? What about the Muslims? 
do they have are, are they the temple of the holy spirit they don't believe in the holy spirit they don't believe in jesus so how can they have the holy spirit because jesus is the one that initiated the holy spirit to come on the scene they're going to have to see a physical representation of a temple in order to believe that their Messiah is there. So until that third temple is rebuilt, there is no mark of the beast. Until that falling away happens, the man of perdition cannot be revealed. He cannot declare himself as God until he sits down in the temple. There's no temple built yet. They're working on it. They're definitely working on it. But until you see an erect temple in Israel, you don't have to worry about the mark of the beast because the mark of the beast ain't here yet. And animal sacrifices will begin again. There has been no animal sacrifices, a wholesale sacrifice for sin in the Israeli community since the destruction of the last temple. All sacrifices ceased at that time. But the Antichrist, once he is established, the sacrifices will begin again. The red heifers are being moved into Jerusalem. They're starting to do ceremonial rites on the temple mount. They're building the furniture for the temple. They're building the garbs for the temple. They are getting serious about building a third temple. So we know that the times are for today. We know that the passages in Daniel, we know that the passages of Revelation are for today. Because Daniel says, lock up this this uh, revelation until the time of the end. And only the people in the time of the end will understand that prophecy. So it has to be us because we understand that prophecy. It gets better. The mark in your right hand or forehead. Hmm. Questions, right? Here's another question. What does it mean to receive the mark in your hand? Remember to receive it in the forehead means that you believe it. You are loyal to it. There will also be an outward sign of some kind whereby people will be able to tell who has the mark and who doesn't. Listen to that very carefully. They will be able to tell who has the mark and who doesn't. So if you're walking on a street around people, and you don't have that mark, they're going to see it right away that you don't have it. It's going to be something on your skin because they won't be, how will they be able to differentiate who has it and who doesn't? It's going to have to be an outward display so they can see who has it and who doesn't. Okay. To receive it in the hand means that when the mark is enforced by the image of the beast, that you're going to go along with it. You're going to go along with that practice. And you won't be able to buy, you won't be able to sell, you won't be able to trade, you won't be able to do nothing. God is so good. God gave me a brand new revelation today. I was done with these, these slides but God had even more to say today. So you're going to even get more of a bonus that I wasn't even expecting to, to do today. Signs to spot the Antichrist early. Second Thessalonians 2, 1 through 4. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there be a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, there's that word again, worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Matthew 24, 23 through 27. 
Then if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is the Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall rise false Christ and false prophets. And they will show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. For as the lightning come out of the earth and shineth even unto the west, so shall all the coming of the Son of Man be. So there's a bunch of false prophets on TikTok right now. Tons of false prophets. They are speaking lies. They are speaking what they want to believe, and they're listening to familiar spirits, and they think they are hearing God, and they're not. Because God's not going to contradict his word. Ever. Revelations 13, 5, 8. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things. There's another sign of who the Antichrist is. He will speak of great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. The tabernacle is the temple. He's blaspheming God in his own tabernacle. What audacity and nerve of this guy. And them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him all kindreds and tongues and nations and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship. There's that word again, worship. It's repeated over and over and over shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life, slain from the foundation of the world. So here's the early signs of spotting who the Antichrist is. One, he will set up a world government. Two, he will be wounded. There will be a deadly wound on him, and he is miraculously healed. Three, He's given a mouth of speaking great things and blasphemies, speaking against Jesus Christ, against his prophets, and against heaven. Four will be lying signs and wonders, and the world will be amazed. Fifth, his appearance, it will be stout, it will be fierce. People say the Antichrist is just a, uh, just a spirit. No, it's not. There is a spirit of Antichrist that is in the world. It's been in the world since the foundations when Adam and Eve set, fell. The spirit of Antichrist came in from the first sin in the garden. That's when the first spirit of Antichrist came in. And boy, we see Cain really adapting to the spirit of Antichrist immediately. And then we see Nimrod. And then we see types and shadows of the Antichrist. Cain was a type and shadow of the Antichrist. Nimrod was a type and shadow of the Antichrist. Nebuchadnezzar was a type and shadow of the Antichrist. Herod was a type and shadow of the Antichrist. Uh, Caesar was a type and shadow of the Antichrist. Napoleon, I mean, Hitler, I mean, so many people are types and shadows of the Antichrist. But then the sixth one, the mark, the image, the name, or the number, the enoma, the authority, the anoma, which is the Greek word name, or the number of his name, which is 666. And seven, he will commit the abomination of desolation. He sits on the Ark of the Covenant. That's why the Ark of the Covenant is not being released yet. It's only going to be released at the very end. So this idiot can sit upon it. And that's going to tie the Jews and the Muslims and Catholicism all together. And they're going to be happy as a lark. And they're going to get along great. Because not only are they going to see their Messiah, but they're going to see a relic of antiquities come back from the dead. Proving the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is real. And they're all going to unite as one. And that is going to be the form of the world religion that we, the world, will have to worship. 
And when will the worship be? It will be on Sunday. The mark of the beast law. Ken Peters, wait, did I miss a slide? Oh no, okay, yeah. Ken Peters, he had a vision and a dream. And he's, he's well renowned in the prophetic communities. He had a dream of the end of the tribulation. He saw the whole entire tribulation. And he said, he saw the mark, and this is what he saw. Other people have had the same dream and saw the exact identical mark. Ken Peters said the Antichrist was the most handsome man that he had ever seen. And he had olive colored skin. Ken Peters saw that the mark of the beast was about the size of a nickel. And it was located in the web between the thumb and the first finger. And it looked like the yellow Mexican sun with another hand in the middle of the sun. Now listen to what he says here. He saw no chip associated with it. Just a tattoo. This man, Prophet Marie Scalar, had a had a, a vision. God gave him a vision, March fifteenth, two thousand fourteen. Still, yet no, another prophetic dream and vision. I saw multitudes of tribulation saints refusing to renounce Jesus as Lord. They were starving, many of them, but still refused to take the stamp on their bodies so they could eat and live. There was what looked like kiosks that were in every little town. They advertised food and water only if you went inside them and took the electronic mark. Some went in and bowed down to the holographic movie image of the Antichrist and were branded in their hands and foreheads with an electronic tattoo-like stamp. When they came out, if they came out, they had a zombie-like look. Their minds and souls were gone. It looked like they had a spiritual lobotomy. Then these immediately joined the armies of those people and police units and were given weapons after they were fed and drank and rested in the kiosk. They were like robots doing the Antichrist bidding. I knew that they were lost forever, but quite a few did not make it out. They were tortured mentally and physically inside these kiosks because if they still refused the mark of the beast, there was a laser that shot through their brain and, and heart and sliced their heads off. Then they were immediately incinerated. Nothing but ashes remained. This was the most horrifying of all. It made the Nazi death camps look like a picnic. If that is possible, millions of people were executed in this way via computer systems automatically with such, pre such precision and efficiency that I marveled that something like this was even possible and could take place on such a large scale. The technology was more advanced than I ever seen. Prophet Maurice Sklar, March 15th of 2014. Look them up. Look Prophet Maurice Sklar up. Everything that he's ever prophesied has come to pass. So this guy has validity, validity in, in, in what he's saying. He's got a website. You can check it out. So did you see here? It said it was like a stamp. It was an electronic mark, a tattoo, a tattoo-like stamp. This is what I got today, just today. The Lord showed me this today. Bill Gates, the digital ID and the mark of the beast. Bill Gates just gave $200 million to the global ID system recently. The total health and wellness package totals over $1.3 billion that he's invested. The central bank currencies are going digital. They're going digital with their currencies. Starbucks coffee as of November of this year will no longer be accepting cash. China just spent 100 billion in digital currencies. Australia and Korea are following the same pattern. Digital currencies are trackable, traceable, programmable, and can expire. This system from the World Forum, they are wanting this to be in place by 2030. And we know that the Antichrist will hack, will hijack this system. Korea is already adopting the digital IB by 2024. And so is a country by, so is a country, the Estonia. Estonia is doing the same thing. 
the world forum states authoritarianism is much easier when no one is hiding in the shadows they admitted it right there they want an authoritarian system biometrics will be used in every aspect you can think of tribulation saints must prepare now we must get ready we're already going into 2023 and they're wanting this system completely implemented no later than 2030 so we have to warn people and we have to tell people that time truly is of the essence do not worship the Antichrist. Do not take the mark of the beast. God can protect you. The golden image in Daniel is a type of the image of the beast. It was 60 cubits high. Its breadth was six cubits. And, it, and they played six instruments that played while the people fell down and worshipped the image. Six, 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 right there. It shows you the mark of the beast right there in Daniel. The image of the beast requires all people to worship it or be killed. Thank the Lord that God speaks in dreams because without those dreams, we would be lost. History will repeat. Ecclesiastics 1.9. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. The tribulation beast will repeat this. He will call all the ten horns, which are regional rulers, presidents, kings, queens, prime ministers, all the rulers on earth, and requiring their worship. 666 repeating. Just as Nebuchadnezzar called all his regional rulers, all his prime ministers, all his cabinet, everybody to fall down and to worship the beast. Revelations 13, 14, and 18. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causes all. See, we have to take the passages of scripture in order. We can't just cherry pick what we want. We've got to look at the whole document. So when he says he causes all both small and great, rich or poor, free and bond to receive the mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, not in their arm, not in their butt. It's going to be in your right hand or your forehead. That's what the Bible says clearly. And that no man might buy or sell, save he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. But this does not happen until they make the image of the beast. There is no image of the beast yet. When you see the image of the beast, then you need to worry. Then you need to be saying, hey, we're starting to wrap this thing up here. Another uh, thing that the, the Lord showed the prophet Maurice Sklar, he said that there was a new technology that the Antichrist was being broadcast on the side of buildings. And it was running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Once again, brainwashing, brainwashing people to receive the mark. But hallelujah, this is where it gets good. That's why I put the curtain there because the curtain was rent in two. Here's the reward of the righteous. Revelations 17, 14. I can't leave you on a downer. I got to give you an upper. I have to get you rejoiceful. I have to get you happy about what the Lord will do for you. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them, 
For the Lord of lords and the King of kings and, and they that are with him are called chosen and faithful. He will fight for us. More good news. To him that overcome will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. To him that overcome will I give to eat of the hidden manna. I will give him a white stone and in the stone a new name, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth. And he that overcome and keepeth my works until the end, to him will I give power over the nations." We are going to be in charge over nations. Hallelujah. More good news. He that overcome the same shall be clothed in white raiment and will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but will confess his name before my father and his angels. He that overcome will I make a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God in the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. To him that overcome will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. If you are martyred for the kingdom, you're going to sit with God in his throne. What greater reward is that? Take my head now. Let's go. Nothing could ever beat that. Nothing. And finally, and lastly, he that overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. We will reign with God for a thousand years in the new Jerusalem. Praise God. He who endures to the end, right, shall be saved. Forever with our Savior, Yeshua, our real life will finally begin. Amen? All right. Praise God. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Great job. I do. Praise God. Yeah, go ahead. So, <clears throat> would you say it'd be a good idea to find a church that has Saturday worship then? Listen, you, I mean, you can do your own thing. You keep the Sabbath day holy. Okay. If you can't find a church that teaches the truth, then you keep the Sabbath day holy. You don't have to go to a church. You don't have to go to a building. The church is inside of you. The body of believers is inside of us. We're having church right now. We are actually having church on the Sabbath. We are having yeah. Sabbath church right now. Did you know that? Friday night is the beginning of the Sabbath. Wow, so every right. Friday night, the Lord is so good. We didn't even try to have the Sabbath, but he set it up already for us. So we are having the <clears throat> Sabbath day church, and we have the seal of God on our heart in our mind and we're keeping the sabbath day holy so if i feel the conviction of no longer going to church on sunday that's okay that's right yeah okay because now that you know the truth yeah. you can't partake of that system anymore because you know the truth but people that are ignorant of that god is not going to hold them accountable because they don't know any better but once you know the truth He's going to hold you accountable for that. Amen. 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 Thank you. Okay, Christopher, go ahead. Oh, hold on. Let me let me uh, let me add on to one second. Oh, sure, um, sure. Uh, for each and every one of you, though, you may be called to still go to that church, but you 
are the representation of the truth as you speak it, you could change uh, people's hearts and minds and bring them to the truth. But that's for you and the Holy Spirit to discuss uh, and go in depth. Do not uh, abandon um, everything just because of what you, you have to continue working out your, um, uh, it's still your responsibility to talk and uh, through your testimony to people, especially in places that have been, uh, um, that, that have been going since the beginning of our lives. Not everybody's been talking this way. So I just want to make that uh, a point that if you've been called to go to a church and you know that the Holy Spirit says for you to go to that church, you bring that uh, as part of your testimony um, to that church. Right. Okay. Many of us will be called in to go into the church because we are the only one. I mean, if we know the truth, it's our job to reveal that truth. How else are they going to learn if you're not there? So God will give you grace because he knows that you're on a mission because he called you there in the first place to represent the light of his truth. So if God calls me to go to a Sunday church, I will absolutely go to a Sunday church because I know that God has called me to go there to shed light and truth. But I will not forsake my Sabbath. I will not forsake my Sabbath anymore. Never again. Never again. Because to much is given, much is required. See, the only way you would understand the mark of the beast is if I broke it down like this. If I wouldn't have explained what the Sabbath was and how it all tied together then what good, what good am I doing for the kingdom? You, you have to learn the truth because it's the knowledge of the truth that sets you free. Exactly. The knowledge written where? Right here. And you use your hand to promote that knowledge. Amen. Okay, go ahead, Christopher. Uh, first of all, I want to say um, that was awesome, John. You know what? Uh, you know it, it's it, it's so nice to have um, you guys on here that have you know the knowledge that you can teach us and uh, show us more things that we've never seen before or heard before. So I want to thank you for that. Um, I, I, you know what, the, where to start? You, you, you know what I love about this? Not only does it dis, dis, demystify things, but it dispels your fear now. Do you no. not feel? No, it doesn't. <laughs> it dispels my fear completely because I know what the truth is. For most of you, though, isn't it like a burden that is lifted off of you? No. Do you not see? Do you not see the truth now for what it is, and it's a lot easier to see, and so no. you're not confused anymore. No, you're I still am. confused. Well, anyway, I, I like I like the fact that what you did this time. Shut your door. <laughs> Sorry, that was my daughter. No problem. Um, it you know when we can start relating things to scripture to what's happening in this world mm -hmm. um that's something that i appreciate and I, I think sometimes this is where a lot of people um are confused or misunderstood you know is if we can show more clarity yes to what is happening in the end times right now and right. and this is something you know um that we as children of god need to do through scripture wisdom knowledge and related to things that are happening right now yeah. and this is this is where most people in this world are blinded 
So, you know, what you said in the red heifers and stuff, it's, you know, like I, you know, I, I go on different platforms and I see this as well. And I appreciate that because it, you know, what you're saying, it gives me a lot more clarity. Good. Um, and I, you know, I, like I, I, I write down a lot of notes, but my question is, here's my question about the Sabbath day to uh -huh. me. I think the Sabbath day should be every day. I agree. You know, you should be worshiping and praying to God and, and, and presenting yourself in the way of God and walking in the footsteps of God. So when I get to the Sabbath day, I <coughs> Saturday or Sunday, I don't know. Like, I hope he doesn't get mad at me because I do this every day. Oh, you know? no. And, and and I don't uh, I my question now now that we know that Saturday is a Sabbath day I don't go to church anymore I haven't for quite a while okay um, but what um, how uh, how do I explain this um, to me worship and prayer and preaching is every day Amen that's how I feel okay. Amen. So um, what is the difference in the Saturday, which I do every time anyways? So mm -hmm. I hope the Lord doesn't get mad at me for that. So how do you explain to somebody about worshiping every day? Okay, so here, here's, the, here's the issue. Some people are not worshiping God every day. So they're only going to use a Wednesday, Sunday thing to worship God because they've been so, uh, you know, it's just been the way that we've been taught in the church. We go on Wednesday nights, we get a little bit of a message. Sunday, he preaches for 45 minutes. We look at our watch and we go home. Yeah. As soon as we look at our watch, the pastor stops and we go home. Um, there's a lot of people that are not doing that every day, but yeah, I mean, you and God would want you to worship him every day. He, he relishes that if we worship him every day, but if some people don't worship him every day, they will use their Wednesdays and their Sundays. So those people that are using their Wednesdays and Sundays after they know the truth, they need to switch to Saturday. But if you're worshiping God every day, if you're keeping the Sabbath every day, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Nothing. Matter of fact, God would want, would wish all of us to worship him. No, that's what... I mean, I try to put myself walking in the footsteps of Jesus Christ and the disciples. So, you yeah. know, that's what I want, and I want to learn as much as I can. If you listen to what he had said earlier, the Sabbath was um, part of the covenant, part of the promise. It is a specific time that you laid aside all your work. Mind you, when this was in, in when this was written, it was written in in a manner in which, in order for you to eat, you had to work that day. You'd work to bring in your food, right? So people get, um, and even today, right now, people will work all day long and not take any time to observe.